Good evening, everyone. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodian of the land on which we meet today and pay my respect to their elder, past, and present. I extend this respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. I also pay my special respect to all the fallen heroes from Spain Revolution in Myanmar, including uh, Go Jimmy and Go Piozzato. And at least not the at last not the least to all our participant panel from different parts of the world to join AMI seminar today. Our AMI president, Christopher Lam, will open the meeting. Chris, the floor is yours. Thank you, May Chair. And uh, it's quite interesting. I, I was rather taken today by the news of the smoking ceremony that the new US ambassador, Caroline Kennedy, had at the American embassy today after presenting her credentials to the governor general earlier in the week or yesterday, I think it must have been, or today. Uh, and she had the ceremony and she also paid her respects to the elders past and present on the land where the US embassy now stands. And I thought that was very interesting to see. But today it's sad for everybody connected with Myanmar. The executions that have been done by the military, uh, shocking. Uh, in any, any way you look at it, it's shocking to see this happen. And AMI will issue a press release about this later. And we may, and it depends on whether it's, it seems to be useful, also write to the minister and hope that that will produce a strong reaction from the Australian government. And there have been reactions from a lot of governments already and a very strong one done by the United Nations Special Rapporteur. Anyway, without losing time, we have two speakers, Simon Fellows. It's wonderful to see you with us, Simon, for tonight. He is the Assistant Secretary in the Southeast Asia Mainland Branch of the Foreign Affairs Department. And before that, he was the head of the Myanmar Task Force. Uh, after he speaks, Emma Leslie will speak, and she's a, an expert on peace and conflict resolution she lives in Cambodia, but she's currently in Canberra, and she has done a lot of work in Myanmar over the last 25 years as well. So we will hear them, and while they speak, please put your any questions you might have into the chat room as usual, and they will be consolidated for the panelists. So, Simon, 15 minutes, please, or less if you, if you feel like it. The floor is yours. Chris, thank you very much. Can I just check that you can hear me okay? Good, okay, thanks Emma. Um, look, thank you very much, um, Chris, Mecha and, and AMI colleagues for the opportunity to present tonight. I too would like to uh, uh, begin by acknowledging the Ngambri Nonawal people who are the traditional custodians on the, of the land on which I'm speaking to you from and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And I'd respect, extend that respect to all Indigenous Australians on the call tonight. Um, I'd also like to thank you, Chris and AMI, for the invitation to participate in this discussion. And I really commend the work of, of AMI in, in providing a platform for discussion of these important issues and, and bringing together the very many um, interested uh, uh, observers and, and um, stakeholders uh, uh, across Australia on Myanmar issues. I'm really glad to see Emma on the line and, and terrific that we can um, uh, share this presentation this evening, Emma, so nice to see you. And, and look, as you said, Chris, obviously we're meeting tonight under really terrible circumstances. Uh, we're gravely, gravely concerned about the reports that we've seen in the Myanmar state media um, that the regime has executed pro-democracy activists over the weekend. As uh, you would all know, Australia is opposed to the death penalty in all circumstances for all people. And we're urgently follow up, following up through our embassy in Yangon to seek further information. But I thought, uh, Chris, it, it might be useful for me to start with a, 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 an overview of Australia's policy settings on, on Myanmar, and a little bit of background to those, and then um, of course, we'll have time for a bit of a Q. Well, we'll have time for a Q and A at, at the end, which will be the more interesting part. And I'm really looking forward to that. So, um, it, it won't come as a surprise to anyone on the call that uh, the, the new government is is continuing to work to formulate its policy on Myanmar. And the Foreign Minister Penistel, Penny Wong has said that the government will be working its way through the commitments that it made on Myanmar prior to the election. 
you will have seen uh, that the minister has been travelling quite widely in the region and she's also been speaking on the phone with her ASEAN counterparts and others. Uh, and, you know, the very clear message that she's been conveying in those discussions is, is that she is in listening mode. So she is uh, very keen to hear perspectives from the region, understand perspectives from the region and work closely with partners in the region, including to respond to the crisis in Myanmar. Um, and to that end, that's why conversations like this are so important as well and why I'm really grateful for the opportunity to hear from, from you on the call tonight uh, and, and others on the call. Uh, it's really important for us to, to engage with stakeholders on Myanmar and, and all the voices for, for democracy in Myanmar. And that's a, an ongoing, um, th this is one in an ongoing series of discussions we, we have and I suspect some on the call join some of those other discussions as well. Um, so. I think you can expect, you know, in some areas there'll be continuity of Australia's position on, on Myanmar, um, but of course other things are going to change. So we'll continue to reiterate our call on the Myanmar military to halt violence against civilians and to return the country to the path of democracy. As, as you all know, the humanitarian, the security, the health, the economic situation in Myanmar has dramatically worsened and continues to deteriorate. And we're seeing the military regime continue to inflict horrific violence on Myanmar's people. You won't be surprised to hear that we'll also continue to work to secure the immediate release of Australian Professor Sean Tunnell, who I know many of you know, uh, so that he can return to his family in Australia. Um, the foreign minister, our embassy in Yangon, uh, and Australian officials use every opportunity to adv advocate for Professor Tunnell's release and will continue to do so until he has returned. We've also made clear our support for ASEAN's leadership in efforts to restore dialogue and end the violence in Myanmar. And we can, have been clear and consistent in urging the military regime to respect ASEAN's role by implementing the five point consensus without delay. We speak directly, regularly with Cambodia as this year's ASEAN chair, as well as our other ASEAN partners about ways we can bolster their efforts. And we know that they're frustrated with the lack of progress so far, and we share that frustration. But we continue to judge that ASEAN efforts remain the most tangible or prospective path to de-escalating the violence, to facilitate access for humanitarian assistance, and to support constructive dialogue. And uh, I, I mentioned that the foreign minister has been discussing Myanmar with her ASEAN counterparts, and, and those discussions are gonna continue over the coming weeks. We also strongly support the role of the ASEAN, the Special Envoy of the ASEAN Chair, the, the currently um, Deputy Prime Minister and Foreign Minister Praxicon. Uh, you will have seen that he visited Myanmar again at the start, end of last month, start of this month, and that continued ASEAN's engagement with the regime on implementation of the five-point consensus. And we continue to discuss with, uh, with Cambodia ways we can support its efforts. But it's not just ASEAN. We certainly don't put all our eggs in the ASEAN basket. Uh, we remain active in the UN um, system on Myanmar issues, including at the Human Rights Council and UN General Assembly. So at the Human Rights Council, we've delivered multiple statements expressing our concerns about the use of lethal force against civilians, the harassment, arrest and detention of political leaders and others, including Professor Turnell, and ongoing human rights violations against the Rohingya and other minorities. And we've called on the military regime to immediately implement its commitments under the five-point consensus in those fora. And so I think you can expect that Australia will continue to work to maintain international attention on the crisis. And we are going to remain strong and consistent in expressing our deep concerns about it. Now, I know that uh, development assistance and, and settings for providing humanitarian support are, are also of interest to many on this call. So I thought I might just give you a quick overview of some of that work and that can set us up for questions a bit later on. Uh, Australia will deliver an estimated $98.6 million worth of ODA, official uh, uh, ODA assistance to the people of Myanmar this financial year. And this continues our long-standing commitment to support the people of Myanmar, prioritising the needs of the most poor and vulnerable and with an emphasis on women and girls. Our development and humanitarian assistance supports the needs of the people of Myanmar, including for healthcare, COVID-19 support, water and sanitation, education, shelter, gender equality, and livelihood support. And despite the significant challenges on the ground in Myanmar, our assistance continues to reach communities across the country, 
including in conflict conflict affected areas of Chin, Kachin, Kaya, Kayin, Shan, and Rakhine states, as well as on the Thai Myanmar border. We're working through trusted partners who are able to continue delivering assistance in the current context, including the United Nations and non government organizations. We do not provide any funding to the Myanmar regime, and we take proactive steps to ensure that Australian assistance to Myanmar does not benefit the military regime. So some examples of Australian assistance that's currently being delivered to support the people of Myanmar. In the health space, we're procuring essential medicines and supplies, delivering mental services and supporting intensive care units for COVID-19 response through local non-government health providers. These include Medical Action Myanmar, Community Partners International, and the Myanmar Medical Association, as well as ethnic health organizations in areas such as Kachin, Kayin, Kaya, Shan, Chin, and Rakhine states. We're also working to support food security, improving the nutrition status and food security of vulnerable populations in conflict affected areas. This includes emergency food support uh, and agricultural assistance. In the education space, we're supporting education services, working through non-government education providers with a focus on ethnic states and focus on marginalized children. We're also providing cash transfers and other forms of social protection to IDPs, internally displaced persons, in Kachin, Shan, Rakhine and Chin in response to increased conflict and vulnerability. This includes assistance to women and girls and vulnerable population groups, including persons with disabilities, building the capacity of 260 civil society organizations and NGOs to respond to gender-based violence and support sexual and reproductive health. We're also providing grants to local organizations to provide life-saving assistance, including distributing basic food and non-food items. And we're supporting civil society organizations in Rakhine and other conflict affected areas with small grants to help them survive in the environment. And then to provide humanitarian assistance as well to displaced and conflict affected, affected people in Myanmar. That humanitarian funding is supporting a range of partners, including the UN, international NGOs and the Red Cross to deliver assistance. Our partners work with local organizations to reach the most vulnerable. For example, with Australia's support, the Myanmar Humanitarian Fund provides grant funding to UN and NGO partners to provide life-saving assistance, including shelter and non-food items and healthcare services. The UN Populations Fund is delivering life-saving technology health services to women and girls, including emergency obstetric care and of dignity kits. And the World Food Program is providing emergency food assistance to people facing food security across the world. So that, that's a very broad summary of, of, our, of our approach, both on our policy things, I suppose, and, and the headlines of our development assistance as it currently stands. And I really look forward to, um, to discussing some of those issues with you. I haven't caught up on the questions yet, but I will in, in a moment. And, um, and with that, Chris, I might pass back to you and, and then over to Emma. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon. That was very interesting. And I'm sure there'll be a lot of interesting questions as well. Emma, your turn. Thank you. And a great honor always to follow Simon. I want to pay tribute to DFAT and the task force and Simon's leadership. Actually, I know a number of people in this room have been given the chance to, to regularly brief you. And I think that's been a very useful relationship over this last 18 months. So thank you, Simon, for kicking off and being willing to hear all the voices and all the perspectives and for sometimes some of us to vent at you also. Um, also to AMI um, for creating this space and of course feeling amongst so many colleagues and so many of you who are championing and working tirelessly and there's nothing I like a day like today to really kick us all in the belly and to um, to really acknowledge um, what's happened to Kojimi and Pio Zayator, um, both friends, both colleagues, and of course, Janelle's here. I know she's very close to Jimmy's wife. Both of them had given so much already to their country. And so to pay the ultimate sacrifice, um, I think for me shows the desperation of this current moment, um, whether Ming Online was emboldened by his vision visit to Russia or not. Um, but certainly a real setback for all of us who, who try to maintain energy and positivity. Um, 
that said, I have just come from Jakarta and I would like to share a little bit about the visit there um, and I had the opportunity to meet with um, Ibu Retnu, the foreign minister. And so I saw there's a question about that in the chat. But lately I've been starting every analysis or sharing or briefing um, with a reminder that this is a crisis and this is a dire situation, but equally um, the day that coup happened, a number of members of parliament who were democratically elected took the oath and they formed a committee um, of parliamentarians which continues to function. They continue to work under the leadership of the NLD, the CRPH chair, Ong Jun Yud. Um, that, that group of parliamentarians, um, more than 200 plus, formed a national unity government and unity being very important because the first time for us to have uh, um, Karen and Kachin um, in senior leadership, we have a cabinet that has um, a member of the Chin National Front as the Minister for Federal Affairs. We have a Karen Women's Affairs Minister. So an extraordinary achievement. And it doesn't stop there. That National Unity Government went on to convene a platform of dialogue the NUCC, which has its problems and has its challenges and has its debates. But that NUCC brought together the widest spectrum of people we have ever seen and gather in Myanmar to form a roadmap and to set out some principles and ways forward. And I think we can't keep talking about that enough. That NUCC now has um, teams and committees and structures working on a new constitution for Myanmar. So I'm not naive enough to think that that's now the status quo, but without those kinds of principled approaches, without understanding that this flow of mechanisms comes out of an election, then we would think that everything is chaos and it certainly isn't. I think second to say, um, way back last year, ASEAN did come out of the gates in a most extraordinary way and we can't forget that either that ASEAN managed a five-point consensus around this fairly quickly. They managed to not invite Ming online as a representative of Myanmar. Um, they did come together. Um, I have to confess on this call that I'm also a Cambodian citizen as well as an Australian one, so have spent quite some agonising days and nights trying to work out how we work with our Ministry of Foreign Affairs to influence them through this last period. Um, we have seen the US and many Western countries reach out to the NUG, in particular um, the US hosting um, Excellency Zimmer Ong and her visit um, very recently um, and very high level people being able to get to meet her. The only country to date, of course, is still the Czech Republic, which, represent, which, um, rep, which acknowledges the NUG as, um, as a legitimate government of Myanmar. Um, and I think we really, if we didn't hit an all-time low this week with um, the executions, we also hit an all-time low with the ASEAN envoy and his Channel News Asia interview. And if you haven't watched it, it's really worth going back to see. And personally, for me, quite disappointing because um, I can say that Excellency Praxicon is actually somebody who has poured his heart and soul into this role. Um, he does fret and worry and, and, and is deeply concerned about the humanitarian situation, but for a number of political factors and reasons um, is now really, I think, at the end of his tether and probably at the end of what he can um, reasonably do in his lead, under his leadership. Um, and aside, we know that Prime Minister Hun Sen wrote to Ming online and said that if the executions go ahead, he would wash his hands of, of Myanmar. Um, and I feel sure that there's a lot of agonising in Phnom Penh tonight as to how to, to now manage that. Um, so not a great success in terms of where we are with ASEAN, but just to um, go to, to Foreign Minister Retno, I was very pleased to hear her say this week that her intention um, is not just to focus on Myanmar, and I think you've seen her in the G20 in the last um, three weeks, extraordinary mediation capacity, facilitation capacity, bringing Russia and Ukraine together, giving space for Australia and China to have a dialogue, um, an endless list of facilitating people who needed to talk to each other across that G20 room. So 
Um, I feel optimistic, not that any one person or any one envoy can bring the answer here, but that she is going to focus on Myanmar, but also to show that ASEAN is still a mechanism that can resolve problems. And she is concerned about the fact that so much of the conversation on Myanmar has now moved to the Lanchang Mekong Committee, um, that China has said this is the best problem solving mechanism now. And so her intention is to bring that back um, front and center for ASEAN. My personal view is their first agenda will be need to be um, to review the five point consensus and to consider a more relevant um, consensus points for this current moment. So tonight is on Australia's response. So what should Australia's response be to all of this? Um, well, first and foremost, I think it is to do what we've already been doing, but to scale it up, and that is to stand beside ASEAN and to support ASEAN um, in this effort. ASEAN is one of the most important conflict resolution mechanisms we have. It gets a lot of criticism for its non-interference and so on, but at least to keep things within the family. If there's anything we know about Myanmar is that it's not a national conflict. It is a regional conflict, and I think we also have to keep narr narrating that, is that this is not one country with borders. This is now a conflict that spills into every other country in the region, and it has for some time, and I think um, we need to stop treating it as something we can't interfere in, but something that is a matter of urgency if we're all going to come out of this um, in some sensible way. I think, secondly, Australia needs to lean on its allies and to be better aligned. One of the things I feel disappointed about over these last 18 months was how little the West has actually well coordinated its response and got on board with each other. Miraculously, they can do that around the U Ukraine. We could have, we did that to some extent around Afghanistan, but somehow over Myanmar, it's been the UK this way and the US this way and the Scandinavians in different forms and I think politically it's really time for those who are relatively like-minded about this to get together and get on the same page. And I have to say, unless there's a strategic reason why Ming Online is allowed to go to Shinzo Abe's um, funeral that next week, I'm, I think Australia needs to be raising this as a serious concern as to why Japan thinks it's acceptable that he can be the representative to Shinzo Abe's um, funeral. My only hope is that somebody's going to arrest him there and be sent to the ICC or some other form, but that will time will tell. And um, just while we're on that, then I am optimist. I am glad that a conversation with China has started. I've had one opportunity to brief Penny Wong when she was in opposition, and my request to her was, please let's try to normalise some level of relationship with China, where at least we can have a conversation around this. Um, China, for all its faults, is concerned about Myanmar. It has maintained contact with all sides, um, contrary to popular belief. They do speak to the NUG. They do speak to ethnic um, resistance leaders, most notably the Kachin, the Wah and the Arakanese. So it's really important that Australia um, engages in that. And I think that in the region, we're always a bit more pragmatic. Um, and I think that would be a, a great place for us to be trying to work out how some of this gets resolved alongside ASEAN, perhaps India, Korea and Japan. Um, Simon's alluded to the um, dire humanitarian crisis. I, I want to say I'm exhausted trying to explain why partnering with the SAC is not any way, shape or form a way to get to those that are the most needy. Those that are the most needy are those that have been bombed to hell since just before Christmas, all through Christmas time until now, bombing continues. That displaces hundreds of thousands of people. Um, we got reports in the last week of people in KR state who can't access medicine, who don't have food, who continue to be hiding in the jungle. Um, and this is now over a year of this kind of behaviour, and yet we continue to think that the AHA Centre with the SAC and with some UN support and the World Food Programme can actually access those people who need it the most. We absolutely have to be pushing Thailand to open the border. 
the states in uh, northeast India are actually already open and transferring things across those borders. But we also have to have a radical new approach if we really want to say that we have humanitarian support um, is to be able to do small grants to small network to networks of tiny, tiny civil society organisations all across those areas that are delivering food and support to people. My own organisation is not a humanitarian organisation and yet we can receive $50,000 from German churches and manage to get small, small amounts of money to all kinds of people. Of course, it's, it's much harder. There are no receipts. There are not easy ways to do things. But through photographs, through accountability, communication, by um, having another party cross-check things, we know for sure our money's not going to weapons if that's what people are concerned about. But more than anything, the people that take up weapons are as concerned as we are and want the rice to get to people. So we really have to look at that. Um, I also hope that, um, of course, I want to just shout out to the Border Consortium who are always extraordinary in their creativity and their ability to get things done. But it's interesting in 2012 when the peace process kicked off under Tinsane, I remember at the time and I acknowledged Nicholas Koppel in the room who carried some of the support forward at that time, um, that ethnic resistance organisations or armed organisations or political organisations, we actually did partner with them at that time in different ways around humanitarian issues. The Nippon Foundation has also sent money through ethnic armed organisations through their political wing, their health departments, their education departments in order to reach people. So I think we're really going to, if we're really serious to save lives in this situation, we're going to have to push the limits of what we understand we can do. Um, I'm going to stop in a minute, but just a couple of other things. Um, kudos to Australia for taking defectors. I don't think that's a very popular decision at any time, but that's really critical to show people in the Tatmadaw that they can defect and that they will be kept safe. And I think we could actually send that message more and make more of it. And we could even systemize better, and I don't mean Australia necessarily, but Australia with partners could systemize better how we how we handle defectors in this situation. Many communities are now um, carrying the burden of having to feed defectors alongside themselves because there's nowhere else for them to go. Um, I know many of you are waiting for Excellency Zimaong to come to Australia. I hope Australia welcomes her with open arms and gives her a full um, uh, full status as, as the Foreign Minister of the NUG um, and that she gets the chance to brief Parliament and do other things as she's been invited in other places. I hope Australia comes clearly with a rejection of the election for next year. The NLD has made their position clear. There are 100 MPs who've had to sign on to the election under duress. The NLD came out three weeks ago and said, absolutely not, we will not participate in this election. There is still, contrary to popular belief, a central executive committee of the NLD that takes these decisions. And of course, um, the NUG and NUCC processes are alongside them in that. Um, I have one controversial thing to say, perhaps, is I am not an expert in military attaches, but I do remember back in the bad old days of the previous Tatmadaw, we made, so many countries made a mistake to withdraw their military attaches from Myanmar. And I think military attaches are one of the ways that we actually get the best information about what's going on inside the country in terms of the actual military struggles from both sides. I um, mean, it's something as a peace builder, I don't have the best expertise in, but something I think we probably still need that information and intelligence to be coming through. Last but not least, let me speak to Rakhine. Um, again, the most extraordinary change in the way that we speak about Rakhine in the last two years, the NUG clear that Rohingyas are citizens of Myanmar, the ICJ decision this week, amazing, rejecting, um, enabling the, um, the court case to go ahead and for Gambia to proceed. But even more than that, if we look closely, the Arakanese army messaging strongly the need for a 10-year blueprint for them to be able to return Rohingyas safely, for a strong call to countries, please help us develop Rakhine State. They're asking for agriculture, hospitals, roads. 
The first government to respond to that was the National Unity Government, who are now through their Ministry of Health building three hospitals in northern Rakhine, in Rohingya areas, unheard of before, that the, that the national the government of Myanmar would in fact be investing in health infrastructure for Rohingyas in partnership with the Arakanese Army. The Arakanese Army has been in communication with low-level um, bureaucrats in the Bangladesh system, although the Bangladesh Foreign Minister is still banking on the SAC. Um, so we have like a lot of work to do in bringing Bangladesh, the Arakanese political leadership in whatever form, um, the Rohingya leadership together, Bank, um, Indonesia and Malaysia, because they carry the burden of the most Rohingya refugees um, in their midst. But so much possibility and ending recently with the UN envoy on the floor of the General Assembly, acknowledging the Arakanese army as a, a positive partner um, in resolving the issue of Rohingya and in some ways um, forcing the hand of Ambassador Jo Mortun to have to thank Bangladesh for hosting Rohingyas in Bangladesh in his reciprocal speech. Never have we seen Myanmar thank Bangladesh for looking after their citizens. So yes, bad days, dark days, friends lost along the way, but equally amazing, amazing things that people do. <laughs> thank you, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Emma, Great. thank thank you very much. That was wonderful. It was really impressive. And the range of issues that you covered will have actually answered quite a lot of the questions that were posed to us, and some of which would have been posed had you not already put them forward to Simon. So before we go to the rest of the QA session, I wonder if I could ask Simon, to whom I'm also very grateful for the presentation that he made, whether he'd like to say anything about the relationship between Australia and Myanmar and the NUG, the CRPH, and then picking up a point uh, put forward by Janelle, uh, what sort of assistance do you provide or could you envisage providing to democracy development in Myanmar? Thank you, Chris, and thank you very much, Emma, for the presentation too. Um, look, uh, we certainly, the, the Australian government recognises the importance of engaging all voices for democracy in Myanmar and all stakeholders in that discussion. Uh, we engage regularly at officials level with uh, representatives of the NUG. We also take the opportunity to make voices for democracy um, where appropriate to do so. Um, in terms of Janelle's question about uh, support for uh, Sorry, let me just find it. It was uh, support for uh, democratic development assistance. So uh, up until the coup, uh, colleagues, we had worked with, with the electoral system uh, to, to, to help develop it. Now, obviously, that's not possible right now, but it certainly worked that we would be looking to, to re-engage in, in future once, um, once appropriate to do so, subject, of course, to the security situation and the safety of local partners. So one of our considerations engaging on the ground in Myanmar is, is the security of our counterparts, uh, security of our partners, and also the security of our own personnel. But it's certainly something we remain interested in, in engaging on going forward. Okay, uh, there was also a mention made by Emma of uh, the forthcoming visit to Australia of Foreign Minister Zinma Al and her hope that uh, the Australian government would receive her with honour and introductions and opportunities to speak to the parliamentarians. And uh, I'd be also very interested to know how you propose to handle that visit. Taking account, of course, that next week, is it next week? Uh, the NUG office in Canberra will have its formal opening. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Certainly, um, we're aware of the, uh, of the you know, uh, discussion of a, a visit by Zin Maong to Australia. As far as where I don't know that we've actually received any correspondence on that yet, or sort of formal correspondence about a proposed visit. Uh, but of course, we would consider um, uh, uh, appropriate level of engagement uh, at, um, at, at that time. And, and I would note that our officials have engaged with Zin Maong previously. We have had discussions with, with her. 
and uh, and it's certainly something we'd look at very closely. I wouldn't. I'm not going to preempt what we go ahead, but um, it's certainly something we'll look at closely. Thank you. Are you likely to be yourself at the opening of the office next week? I know several Australian parliamentarians uh, are going to be there. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. Look. Uh, um, we again, and, and I'm not not trying to be tricky here. We we don't sort of for, foreshadow our engagement before it happens, but certainly our, our practice has been for for Australian officials to engage with NEG representatives. <laughs> Very tricky. And Chris, can I just answer one question? Simon didn't answer or couldn't answer whether Zimma Ong meets Parliament is not up to the government or DFAT. <laughs> it's up to the Parliament. Yeah. Indeed. Thanks, Janelle. Yeah, Sorry, Janelle Simon. On that, Janelle, we're waiting. You may have earlier information than some of us, but we're waiting to see who's going to be the chairman of the Joint Standing Committee from the Parliament uh, as it's reconvened and how the Friends Group is going to organise itself. Do you know anything about that yet? Um, look, I think it will all carry on as, it, you know, it will be okay. <laughs> it will be. It's just a question of who the people will be, I suppose. Yeah, it is. Look, I don't want to preempt anything. That's up to them to announce it. Good. Well, moving back to the other questions, the, the some of them that have been put in by people are quite well handled by what Emma has said, and and also Simon, of course. I think the the point made by Emma, the points made by Emma about Praxicon and the position that he's found himself in through this year have been very difficult for him to handle, very difficult indeed, but they won't be a lot easier for Retno when Indonesia takes the ASEAN chair. How do you see Indonesia playing its cards during this ASEAN chair role? Um, I think you mean for me to answer that, Chris, and actually, yes. I mean, I, I think um, Hun Sen actually set off in a good direction. He had the notion of a win-win policy, which he'd obviously implemented in his own unique way to bring peace to Cambodia. Um, and I think we all were optimistic that, okay, he could visit the SAC the first time, and that was problematic, but we expected him then um, well, through the ASEAN envoy then to be able to reach out to other stakeholders. Um, and I was surprised to hear Praxicon say that they are, um, they have a negotiation strategy that they are quietly reaching out to other stakeholders or that he wasn't willing to share that. But in fact, that's not true. And to date, the likes of the Korean National Union, Chin National Front, um, Chin Independence Army, none of them have had any contact with the envoy despite writing directly nor has the NUG, despite council, countless communications um, to them. So um, I think the difference is that Excellency Retno has already made some of those relationships. Of course, um, the Malaysian Foreign Minister has been very open about those that he's made. Um, but I think at this point, it's absolutely critical that we consider a roundtable for dialogue um, not bilateral ones, mistake that's been made in the past of having the NLD versus the military. I think this is finally a more balanced landscape in terms of the various stakeholders um, that exist across Myanmar and have various claims. Um, the question will be what the format is, how does that look, but at least a willingness and an openness to recognise that this is a complex, complex system and requires a lot of a multitude of layers of of dialogue, of negotiation, of bringing people together, of transition, um, and that there's no big one pill that anybody gets to take. And I think that's a good thing with her is that she's she's energetic, but she's from day one um, understood quite deeply the nuances of this um, and, and is willing to engage with various stakeholders. But I don't want to preempt she has not got a formula as far as I know or that she's shared. Um, but she's very serious and focused. And I think we should all be aware that there is a conversation going on in Jakarta as to whether it makes sense for the foreign minister to, to be also the envoy. And there is a conversation going on in ASEAN as to whether it makes sense to chop and change the ASEAN envoy for Myanmar every year. And I think these are probably very constructive conversations really critiquing ASEAN's capacity to solve this in the formula that they've been using. And I think that's a very welcome discussion. That's good, thank you very much. Now, Simon, 
there were some questions about the aid program and you gave some answers yourself on the total and about the way it's distributed. But one of the things that people who are here will possibly want to say, and some of the questions go to that point, is that the way the program has been distributed in the past has basically been through, uh, how can I put it uh, neatly, uh, trusted partners or UN organizations. It doesn't reach down to the people at the ground roots, at the grassroots levels. And for many of those that need the assistance most desperately in the country, the grassroots are where the assistance needs to get to. And that means it has to be delivered in a way that doesn't come close to military fingertips. Do you have any answer to people who ask those questions about how Australia's aid program might, with the, with the new government in place, look for new ways of handling, handling money that goes there and doesn't always look for the same kind of accountability receipts and things that Emma referred to when she spoke that would normally be needed. For Myanmar, they're just not possible. Thank you, Chris, and thanks for the question. Um, look, this is this is something that we look at closely and we look at consistently and we look at it closely. Uh, you know, as you all know, and as we've been discussing, the, the environment, the operating environment in, in Myanmar is obviously very complex and, and very volatile. Um, and there are a range of restrictions uh, on, on banking, cash transfers, travel, access, company registration, and, and these things are all changing day to day. Um, and, and we work through the, those existing trusted partners that, that you referenced, Chris, because they have established systems and frameworks in place and networks to ensure the accountability that we require when we are looking at spending government money and taxpayers' money, uh, and also to mitigate some of the risks in the current environment. So our embassy in, in Yangon does engage with local partners, um, although our funding is, is provided indirectly. So, so we meet with them bilaterally and we meet with other donors to discuss situation on the ground, the challenges those partners are facing, and how donors, the UN, NGOs, and, and the local part uh, can better support the work that those local partners are doing, including with partners who are working in some of those conflict area, conflict, conflict affected areas that we've been talking about, Chin, Kaya, Kain, and Rakhine. Um, I would note that there's uh, sort of there are a couple of questions in, in the chat and, and um, Emma mentioned the, the cross-border uh, challenges and, and opportunities. We are a, a long-standing humanitarian donor to communities on both sides of the Thai Myanmar border, working with NGOs and partners, including the Border Consortium and the International Rescue Committee. Uh, and we also work with humanitarian partners, including UN agencies, to deliver on the Myanmar side of the Indian border, uh, including in Chin and Sagain. Uh, we don't currently deliver assistance across the border from, from India or from Thailand. Um, but we continue to have discussions with those partners about ways we can um, more, you know, further contribute to providing support to communities on, on both those borders. Um, and, and as the situation evolves, we continue to review and assess our settings um, to, to, to try and respond to the scale of the need, and through, including through providing life-saving assistance. I hope that goes some way to answering your question, Chris. Yeah, it does, sort of, it does, yes. But I'd just say that AMI has now had a lot of experience in discussion with people about these sorts of things, and we would welcome an invitation to discuss these things with DFAT if, if the opportunity should arise for you. Uh, we know that you talk with others, and we know something about those conversations, but we would like very much to make some contribution ourselves because we can see, as you can see yourself, perhaps from the range of people who are here today, we can see a lot of what the grassroots actually do. And we've also had people speaking in our seminars in the past from the grassroots, from places which are directly impacted, and they've never heard of the organisation, the so-called trusted organisations, never heard of them. They, for them, the Australian aid programme, and that of a lot of other countries too, comes as a very top-down pyramid-shaped exercise that actually doesn't have enough in it to get down to the base of the pyramid, to the grassroots. So if we're able to help you with that in any way, we're very happy to do so. Uh, moving from there and back to the other things, uh, the point was made that uh, Min Aung Hlaing plans to have elections in 2023, all being well. We have contributed from Australia in the past to the development of election laws and election processes. And I myself, in, back in 88, 89, did those things with the, with the then 
military regime, and they survived to produce an election system which actually was good enough to get Aung San Suu Kyi eventually elected to govern the country. All that's gone now. <clears throat> what do you propose to do other than just watch from the sidelines as, as Min Aung Hlaing takes the country towards elections which nearly everybody recognizes are likely to be a fake? Thanks, Chris. That's an answer for, oh. question for you, Simon, not me. <laughs> Look, well, what an, I'll start, Emma, and then um, <coughs> pass it to you. But, Chris, we wouldn't, of course, um, I, I think we, we share your concerns about prospects for elections that have been announced next year. Uh, it's, it's very clear that um, it, it's... Uh, you know, there are going to be some very, very serious challenges to the credibility of those elections as currently proposed. Uh, and we'd note, take note of the NLD statements about uh, about the elections and um, and refusing to participate. So, you know, we continue to discuss um, with a range of partners, with, with Voice for Democracy from within Myanmar and from the, the international Myanmar community, with our international partners, with our ASEAN partners, that outlook for those elections. Uh, we'll continue to convey uh, our view on, um, on the importance of the military regime returning the MR to the part of democracy. Uh, and we'll continue to keep a focus on, on Myanmar in international forums with a view to trying to um, build, build the pressure around that expectation. In, in terms of, of how we will respond when the elections are, are held, I think it's too soon to say, but uh, it's, it's something that we're tracking very closely and, and consulting very closely with our, with our colleagues and, and partners on it. And we welcome the opportunity to hear from, from groups like this on the elections as well. I might live there in the past over to Emma. My concern about the election is that some countries are so hungry for some level of stability here after all of this turbulence. Um, that the elections are being portrayed as the exit strategy, that even if we, um, you know, we, we might not like them, but at least, okay, there's some level of stability here, they can go ahead and therefore we can work with what comes out of them and then transition. And I think maybe that was true of the old Tatmadaw system back in 20. 2008, 2010, 2012, we saw all of these steps towards the, the implementation of Thun Shui's um, plan to, to change. That's not true of this election. And I think that's the part that Australia and all of us in this room can play a role in helping, um, frankly, the Japanese envoy, um, China, sometimes India, um, and, and some other countries around the system, uh, Russia, obviously, to say that, well, you can have this election, so be it. But it doesn't actually change anything. It just keeps the status quo because we still have two parallel universes which are just not going to function together. And I think it's really hard to explain to people that, um, you know, I mean, all this is sort of engaging the Taliban. That's the way we do things now because that's the best that we can manage. This is not Afghanistan. This is not Ukraine. This is Myanmar. And we've been down this track before. So elections are not mechanisms for conflict resolution. And we really have to leverage that as the election will not stabilise anything. It will just consolidate and deepen the crisis that we're already in. And so we can say it can happen, it won't happen. It will happen, I'm sure of it. If, if Ming Online is still any level of control by then, which we hope not, um, but if he has, he will go ahead. And we've already heard inner circle people say, even if it's 40 townships out of the 300, and somebody can correct me how many townships are there, but 320 townships, even 40 townships, he will run the election in those 40 townships. So the key for us is to be working with other countries, not to say we'll just reject the election, there's already been one, that argument doesn't seem to fly, but to explain that an election will not solve the problem. 
we will not come out of an election and be like, great, we've now got a legitimate group of people we can work with. That's not going to solve anything. It will just, yeah, I'm repeating myself. But I think that's the key for us. Okay, thank you. As, as for that point, you know, one of the things that occurs to me about these elections, if they do run them in 40 townships and produce the thing they call a new Lutor, then one of the things that countries like Australia, through their own parliament, should consider doing is working in the IPU, the Interparliamentary Union, to make sure that the IPU does not give credit to whatever is elected by elections of that sort. And that will require advice from DFAT to the Australian Parliament about how the Parliament should comport itself in that event and should work with other countries to make sure they're ready for the same sorts of possibilities. But I think now, as we're running a little bit short on time, we'll go back to the questions that there are. Emma made a point about uh, poor coordination among the Western like-minded countries. And I think it's a good, strong point. Is DFAT engaged with other the other like-minded like countries about how to work off the same page in, in relationship with Myanmar? Simon? Thank you, Chris. Can you share, Chris Kittle here? I'll find you breaking up a little bit then, but if you can hear me, I'll, I'll keep speaking. You're a little bit broken. The, the question is about uh, the degree to which uh, the Australian government, through DFAT, works with the other like-minded countries on Myanmar issues at the UN or elsewhere, or, or in terms of the relationship with Myanmar bilaterally, do we work on the same page as them or are we uncoordinated? Is the West uncoordinated, to use that word? Thank you, Chris. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, okay. A little scratchy, I'll, but yes. I'll give it a go. I, I, I'm just working on a plan B now, but um, yes, certainly we, we have regular contact and regular discussion with, with a range of international partners. Uh, of course, each of us um, in, in formulating a national response uh, have a different set of considerations and, and equities to weigh to, to develop that response. And so we do compare notes and we do coordinate. Um, I take your, your point that, uh, that there could, could be more of, of that, but, but I can assure you that, um, that behind the scenes, government, many governments are coordinating quite, quite closely on these questions and, and working together to try and identify ways where we can exert a positive, positive influence on the situation. And I might just pick up on a, a point Emma made earlier, I meant to respond to just about the role of Indonesia next year. Certainly, um, you know, we agree, uh, as I said earlier, you know, ASEAN is, is critical to this equation. And um, we have been really, it, 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 there's, no, there's no understating how tough it is for, for ASEAN and, and for, for everybody in trying to find a way through or a way forward on this crisis. We, um, while ASEAN has come in for a lot of criticism, we think that, you know, Brunei did an admirable job as, as the inaugural um, ASEAN uh, well, as the ASEAN chair at the time, the coup occurred and, and with Foreign Minister Erewhon as the inaugural special envoy. Praxicon, similarly, we know that um, he has been really personally invested and, and committed in trying to trying to work towards progress. And, and it's really, really hard. We're confident uh, that um, Ibu Retno will similarly um, bring, uh, as Emma said, her deep expertise and, and, and a thoughtful approach to this challenge. But there's no understating how, how challenging and complicated it is. So that's why for us, it's so important to continue to support ASEAN's efforts, despite um, what, what is, of course, not it, progress isn't moving as quickly as we would like. Back to you, Chris. Thank you, Simon. I think because of the time and because we know you have to go at seven o'clock, uh, we have room for one more question. And the one that I have, it's, it comes from the point made by Emma about defectors, but it relates to it more widely. We have uh, from our diaspora members and others in Australia, uh, indications of some very uneven handling of visas for people in Australia. The students who have sought to, uh, bridging visas have got different types of bridging visa without explanation about how they work. And it all sits in rather difficult 
light alongside the generosity which the government has displayed towards people from Ukraine in particular, and to a lesser extent, although rather late, to uh, Afghans coming to Australia, or certain Afghans. But the, the uneven situation of people seeking visas is difficult. I don't know how it works with the defectors or who exactly a defector is. For example, does a defector have to be someone who's defected from the military, or can it be somebody who's defected from the government? And we, we have, in our knowledge, several people who, who have left the government and are being treated as uh, political outcasts or worse, are hunted as criminals. Are these people that you would expect to be able to get access to Australia as defectors? And can you say anything about the relationship you have with the Home Affairs Department about uh, the some rather more even and sensitive handling of bridging visa questions from students? Thanks. Sure. Thank, thank you, Chris, and thank you for the question. Um, look, we obviously we don't com well. It, it won't come as a surprise to let you. Know we don't comment on individual cases, and and the types of cases that you have mentioned um, inherently are obviously particularly sensitive ones. And so I, I won't go to the to the nature of in, individual types of questions. But we do uh, we do have a humanitarian program that provides protection and resettlement for refugees from all over the world including to, to, national, uh, to Myanmar nationals. Um, our offshore humanitarian program is designed primarily to assist people who've left their home countries because of persecution or severe human rights abuses and who have no option for return to their country. And, and, um, and that is, is something that we discuss. We're, we're in regular discussions with our colleagues at, at the Home Affairs Department about um, uh, settings for, for Myanmar and that's an ongoing discussion. Um, you mentioned earlier, Chris, the situation for Myanmar students, and I do just want to address that. Uh, we, we were aware of the, the difficult situation that all, all um, Myanmar nationals in Australia uh, currently face due to the situation and, and, the, and the challenge or impossibility of being able to return home at the moment. And that includes for students here on Australia Award scholarships, which are government scholarships. Um, we are we're closely engaged with the Home Affairs Department on this issue and, and uh, looking at pathways that would enable uh, students who are in that situation to, to remain uh, to remain in Australia for, for those who are impacted by this situation and unable to return. And that includes consideration of um, the, the return to home country and debt conditions that are associated with the visas that are issued for recipients of those types of scholarships. Um, but in the in the interim, uh, visas for Australia Award scholars have been extended out until the end of November, pending a, a longer term resolution of this issue in discussions with the Home Affairs Department. Okay. We certainly, I, sh I should say, Chris, we we do um, do appreciate. I know that uh, you and, and other colleagues on the line probably too have at, at, from time to time drawn our attention to to particular individual cases, and while I. Uh, as I said at the start, I can, I can speak about individual cases for privacy reasons, as you'll understand. We do appreciate that, and we're we're always happy to hear from from you and other colleagues, and we'll to assist where we can. Don't worry. Thank you very much, Simon. And I wouldn't uh, dare, also for my own reasons, to bring forward any particular name. Certainly not in a discussion like this one. Uh, although, much as I respect all of our colleagues, I think we have to be very careful with individual privacy considerations but also their security considerations and those that apply also to their families. But um, it's good. Now, uh, we, we finish now, but uh, the Australian Embassy in Yangon, is the charge now in place? Are you able to tell us a little bit more about the way the embassy is organised now? Yes, thanks, Chris. Um, yeah, to confirm, we do have a, a, a charge in, in place. In Yangon, um, that person is a, an experienced, a, a, a experienced uh, career diplomat with exper ambassadorial experience in the region, uh, and and they have they have taken up that position uh, as charge d'affaires to Myanmar.